I did a, I did a CAT scan uh, for my arteries about three years ago and unfortunately found that I have uh, about 50% blockage in my arteries. I changed my whole lifestyle to become a full vegan, plant-based diet, uh, exercising. And uh, uh, my first question for you, doctor, is after three years, um, uh, what, what kind of test would you recommend uh, me to, uh, to do or to consider in order to, to see if uh, there is an, any, any improvement? I know that cats can have, as you mentioned uh, in your presentation, uh, some radiation. You mentioned yes. the test CIMT. I, I learned about it from you also from some uh, previous presentation. I asked my primary care physician to do it and he refused. Is there any way- Aaron, you... can I ask you, wh where do you live? I live in uh, uh, Framingham, Massachusetts, near Boston. Okay. okay. And... I can help you set up the testing at a distance and do a lot of consultation outside of Michigan. Um, but you know, these are general comments. Um, there have been amazing advances in heart CT measurements using artificial intelligence. Some people call that deep uh, machine learning. And we now have the ability, unlike any other time, where I can tell patients exactly the content of their heart arteries, how much is hard plaque, soft plaque, called low density, soft plaque, very dangerous, uh, the amount of volume in the artery, the amount of narrowing the artery. And for certain people, that's a good choice. It's always gonna be a CT with radiation. There's no other kind of CT and you have to have healthy kidneys. The CIMT can be arranged. It's a difficult study to find and difficult to get a good quality. You'd think it'd be easy in Boston with all the Harvard hospitals I've tried. That might be an excellent choice too. And I finally will say for the audience in general, stress testing has some role. I don't order nuclear radioactive stress tests. I order routine or echo ultrasound stress tests. But there's nothing better than seeing somebody be able to go above average fitness and do well. It's indirect, but very important data. So don't want to give you more specific ideas because uh, we have to be general here. Uh, and you always want to work with your own medical team. Thank you, Aaron. Good luck. Thanks very much for that, Dr. Khan. And up next, we're going to bring in Lee S. Uh, Lee, welcome. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khan. Um, uh, clearly fish is not plant-based, but I am 90% plant-based in my diet, but I do consume fish oil every day. And I recently read that certain level taking fish oil, if you have a proclivity to having AFib, it could raise your chances of getting AFib. And I'm just concerned. I know that you're a vegan, but what your objective opinion is about fish oil and AFib. Yeah, you know, I have lots of patients that aren't vegan and I deal with them too, and we love it on them. You know, uh, the studies you're talking about used very high dose pharmacologic versions of um, fish oil, uh, Vasipa, uh, Lovaza, and others. Uh, most people don't take anywhere near those doses and they're just buying uh, kind of balanced fish oil at vitamin shops or from a integrative doc. Um, I was, you know, I've had people in practice in atrial fib for years, never observed anybody with that, but we have to be concerned. And maybe, you know, like many things, there's a sweet spot, some dosing of omega-3 supplements, but not massive dosing. Although I will say, although Dr. Ornish's studies weren't huge, he did use four grams a day, which is considered high dose omega-3 from a fish source. And at least in those patients, no reports of atrial fibrillation. But um, yeah, I just wouldn't go ultra high if you can get more omega-3 from ground flaxseed, chia seeds, hemp hearts, walnuts, chlorella. We forget that chlorella, a real food that provides omega-3 and 40 minerals and nutrients also is very rich in omega-3. So I like my patients to actually supplement with a handful of chlorella every day. It's very, very healthy. Thanks very much for that, Dr. Khan. And up next, we're going to bring in Joel. Welcome, Joel. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Khan. I greatly appreciated your presentation and all the work you do even beyond the conference. Uh, my question is this, I, uh, my, that Cordio Prev study was mind blowing. I mean, it's, it's obviously very much uh, different from what we've been hearing in the vegan community for quite a while now. My question is this, I, I'm not sure I fully understood some of the results. If the 
the focus of the study, and at least in part that you presented, seemed to be a, a difference between uh, a Mediterranean diet and, and more uh, extra virgin olive oil, uh, comparing it to a low fat diet. Uh, is it possible to use a bad pun here that we could have our cake and eat it too? It seems like the amount of calories in olive oil, if we have half a tablespoon a day, would only be roughly, you know, whatever, 80 calories, and we could still maintain a very low fat diet. So I'm, I'm a little confused about that 35% number and exactly where we should be in, in, in our uh, fat intake during the day. Well, again, that's, I think, a good question, and I'm glad your name's Joel, but, um, you know, it's a, it's a controversy. I mean, and that, it's been a controversy since Dr. Ansel Keys pointed out, high-fat diet in Crete, uh, high-fat diet in Finland were very different, and that is data that everybody recognizes in the nutrition world, so you have to go to be a bit of a biochemist and look at saturated fat content and plant versus animal fat content and the rest, you know. As I said, what a joy it would have been if the Cordioprev study had an arm that was um, whole food plant-based and less than 15% of calories total fat, more like a traditional uh, cardiac reversal diet that we talked about, but they just didn't do it and might not accept it. If anything, you know, you might have thought that what they called their low fat arm, and it certainly was not ultra low fat, but they encouraged people to eat more legumes and whole grains meaning they probably were eating less meats and dairy and poultry. You think that might be the winner in this study. And it's obviously provocative that it wasn't even close. And what they still haven't reported on is overall survival and events. So we do need to keep an open mind that so far they've got endothelial function data that's quite remarkable and carotid artery regression and kidney health data that's quite remarkable. But uh, we'll be looking for more study maybe next year. There'll be an update. But um, you know, I don't know what the optimal diet is, but I'm pretty sure one can argue on real food that's brightly colored and rich in antioxidants, a high polyphenol extra virgin olive oil is one of uh, the least dangerous choices you can make. Reminds me of those old commercials. Motor oil is not motor oil. It's not of all, not all olive oil is created the same as well, I'm sure. It's very, well, there's recently been reports now, this is true of our food industry, that a source of extra virgin olive oil from Spain was actually seed oils and not olive oil. Uh, there's fraud in many food industries. People buy salmon, it's not salmon, and they do genetic testing, and it's not the, the fish they were told it was. And, uh, you know, if you can make some money and provide a lower quality product, uh, one has to be pretty picky. The couple of brands I showed, I I uh, don't know um, all the specifics, but I think you could r rely on for being the authentic version promoted and their high polyphenol, which is probably the best of all worlds. Excellent. Thanks, Dr. Khan. And up next, we're going to bring in Wayne. Hi, Wayne. Hi, thank you. Um, my question is about coconut oil. Is it to be avoided at all costs or is it not a reasonable oil for sauteing and you know, maybe frying or high heat. Yeah, I can't find, you know, I've evolved my own thinking. I've written a number of uh, articles on avoiding oils in general and bringing uh, the healthiest diets to a very low total fat content. And I've evolved my thinking because the science appeared. I don't see that happening with coconut oil. I don't see any new data Maybe there's one small randomized study in people with early memory problems in the last year, I think I read, that suggested there might be a benefit in a very specialized group of people with early uh, you know, risk of dementia. But with the exception of that single study, um, I don't see the community finding research or recommendations that there's anything good about coconut oil. Uh, it seems to be the most injurious to our lining of our gut, causing that metabolic endotoxemia and inflammation. Of course, as many practitioners use coconut oil to relieve inflammation, but the actual data suggests it's harmful to our gut, it can drive inflammation, and it certainly will raise your cholesterol. What I tell my patients, because again, not all my patients are vegan, if you're going to go off on a binge and do a four or six week keto, paleo, 
uh, coconut oil in your coffee crazy program. Get your cholesterol done before and maybe four to six weeks later, because about 30 to 40 percent of people, the cholesterol skyrockets and don't take it by chance, you know, do it by a systematic science approach and obviously get the heck off of it if your cholesterol is 400, which can happen. And I've seen it many times. 